Welcome everyone to Mail Fuzz TV. I am Peter, that is Connor, and we are going to talk about Star Trek The Next Generation Season 6, Episode 20. It is called The Chase. So full spoilers for the episode as always. Uh, this episode, uh, I feel like when we read the IMDb description last time for this episode, this is maybe the only episode I think in the entirety of the show where I feel like it actually told us too much because it kind of told us what the end result of the episode was. Yeah, yeah, and it takes quite a while for the episode to get to where it told us it was going. Yeah, like we're not, the episode's not even asking the question that that's the, an, the answer to until like halfway through. So uh, yeah. it was kind of it was kind of a weird because I, I did remember what we said of what, what this was going to be. Uh, that said, though, when we do get to the answer, it's quite an interesting concept for an episode, and uh, it's a it's an interesting bit of mythology to. You know, it, it kind of ties into the the old idea that human beings were just, you know, aliens dropped us off long ago, or dropped off the DNA at least, <laughs> and kickstarted evolution on yeah, Earth. Yeah, pretty much, it's it's the oh, why why are there so many bipedal humanoid carbon based life forms? Yes, it's like oh, nah, well, we're, somehow we're all related. Yeah, and that does actually, you know, make some sense. <laughs> like in the context of this show, where You've got Romulans, you got Vulcans, you got Cadassids, you got Klingons, et al, et al. <laughs> yeah, Ferengi it, even. It, it makes sense in a lot of the, you know, in a lot of sci-fi worlds to have this sort of concept. I think we've we've touched before in, in Trek specifically about like Vulcans and Romulans being a lot closer related than than some of the others. But I mean, I can see pretty close similarities, say, between Klingons and Cardassians. They both have similar kind of those facial ridges oh don't tell them that they'll be very upset oh yeah, they, they would be very upset but i think they're probably closer on the evolutionary tree than klingons and humans that's probably true but it does make sense that we all are you know so so the, the plot of the episode it kind of it's, it's very much of two halves because the first half is that picard's old professor his old archaeology professor is visiting and he's got him a gift uh which is all kind of like thematic hint for what the episode's going to be about but yeah. uh he wants picard to drop being a captain and come with it and i when he when he first suggested this for the first few seconds i thought he meant oh this is like a weekend and i was like ah yeah maybe picard will go that, that, that sounds like a fun little trip for him and he, it, he even <laughs> talks about how hey if we had you know everything at our facility you know the the uh, the full starship the credentials you know, this will be a couple of weeks yeah, but he's like, oh, this will take maybe six months to a year. And I'm yeah. like, Picard can't just drop this for a year? Do you not understand and, this, man? And that's pretty much the conclusion Picard comes to pretty quickly is, yeah, no, I can't do that for a year. I mean, I would argue that he immediately comes to that conclusion, and the only reason why he sort of deliberates over it is because he feels guilty and doesn't want to say no. But he kind of yeah. always, you know, when he talks to Beverly about it, it's very clear from the get-go that, you know, he was never going to not, choose the, the thing he was going to choose it is uh, let's say i think maybe if, if it was a case of ah, oh, he could take a a few weeks uh personal leave for a, you know yeah he could probably get away with that oh yeah yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe a month but not not a year so uh i thought they did some nice little things with this character and that uh so when he first comes on and it's this surprise that he's there uh, he calls Picard Mr. Picard, and he does it a couple times, and he says, oh, sorry, I should be saying captain now, because obviously he knew him before he was a captain. And Picard's like, oh, no, it's fine, you know, whatever. Like, your Mr. Mr. will do. Um, there's a great bit after he gets mad at him, when Picard's, like, made it clear that he's turning him down and that he will not, you know, he will not change his mind. He's, he's very adamant that he's he's staying with the ship. Uh, he walks out and he goes, yeah, that, no, that'll be all. I have nothing left to do here, captain, and walks out. I thought it was impressive that in 15 minutes or whatever it was at that point in the episode that they'd set up enough between these two characters that him just saying the word captain had so much weight behind it because they established that you know he knew him before then they established that he kind of resented Picard for picking the Starfleet sort of path in his life because he wanted him to be the next generation's greatest archaeologist like he was and so, so when he said that, like there was just you know, he completely got that he was pissed off and he was thrown at his face. Your, your captain Picard, because that's not what he wants him to be. He wants him to be his, I don't know, Indiana Jones Jr. or <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, a short round, yeah, a short round. There you go. Um, so 
I, I, thought, I thought there was some neat little writing touches there. I thought the relationship between Picard and his professor was interesting to talk about. Whenever he was talking to Beverly about it, it was it was an interesting relationship to bring up. Uh, that he was more of a he had more of a father son bond with this guy than he did his own father, and likewise for him, he had more of a bond with Picard than he did any of his own children. So it's, it's sort of given as a, a relatively prominent character from Picard's past, but not one that feels that shoehorned in because. It's a university professor. It's something that he definitely had. It's something that, you know, is fits into a part of his life quite neatly. Yeah, and he's spoken about that part of his life quite a lot. And he's definitely spoken about his love of archaeology. That's come up a few times. Yeah. Yeah, has, uh, it's been, I think, at least in season two, I want to say. It's kind of been a recurring theme. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Vash went on a little archaeological uh tr- you know adventure yeah you could call it that i suppose <laughs> so yeah you could yeah um no I, I enjoyed the interactions with the character uh and then of course his his death comes quite abruptly um actually if i have like a weird nitpick of the episode is that i thought they were they were setting up something because you know the um maybe they explained this and i missed it but uh so they leave him behind he leaves in his shuttle and then the, the distress calls him and says, I'm being boarded. And so the Picard and the Enterprise rush to him, and there's a ship with him locked in a tractor beam, and they try to beam him off, but they have to, like, stop the tractor beam first. So he's like, hey, like, fire something at the ship to disable their beam. And the wharf just sends a little, little, you know, little tap, and it the yeah. ship just blows up. And I was like, oh, that's fishy. It's almost like that ship wasn't real, and it was, like, on shore or something like that. But it just completely combusts and it's a little plot point because Riker's like, "Hey, Worf, what the hell did you just do?" And he's like, "What? I I didn't send enough to actually destroy it. It was like it was a little tap." So I yeah, thought- I, I think he says that it shouldn't have even disabled their shields or something like that. But maybe they didn't have shields up. I just I felt like a plot point that was coming up for like there, there would be some reason later why this ship was so easily destroyable or destructible. Mm. So I, I don't know. That was a bit weird, but. Uh, then the second half of the episode, though, is the mystery of what he was looking into. Because obviously he wanted Picard to go with him because he's got this find of a century. The, the, the most important archaeological find that anyone in a long time's ever had. And it's basically what it turns out to be once they start looking into it, is that he's been collecting DNA samples from all over the galaxy, from different planets, one of which is human, uh, one of which is whatever else. And clearly as the episode goes on, Klingons, Cardassians, probably Romulans, <laughs> like because they all show up at some point uh, looking for the same thing, which is why the episode's called The Chase. Uh, but basically, there's similarities to all these DNA strands, but not only that, they kind of form a, a larger whole. Like they're part of an algorithm, as, as Jordy puts it. They make some sort of message, and you know, it's leading them somewhere. Yeah. Uh, they they might suspect it's a weapon. Well, the Klingons definitely think it's a weapon. They're hoping they're it's a it. weapon. Yeah. Uh, so, and I actually, I think my favourite part of this episode, other than just the overall sort of idea, when we get to the end, is just the way that as Picard is, like, taking the Enterprise and trying to investigate this, other, like, races just keep showing up. Like, you know, when they get to the planet and the Cardassians are already there and they're like, hey, piss off. It's like, okay, the Cardassians, maybe they're the ones behind some of the, the shady things that have been going on. And then a minute later, the Klingons show up. You're like, wait, Klingons are here now too? What the hell? It's like, what, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, it just kind of throws everything in. Yeah, and then eventually Romulans just kind of like saunter into the scene as well. And uh, that was, at that point, you just sort of cackle a little bit because you're like, oh, of course. <laughs> Why wouldn't they be here at this uh, point? Yeah. It's not every humanoid species in Star Trek, but it is some of the major ones that on this show in particular they've been uh, confrontational with, uh, would be the way I'd put it. You know, because like, a part of me was thinking, where's the Vulcans? But from just from a thematic standpoint, the Vulcans aren't uh, a race that they've been fighting with. The Vulcans have been friendly, even in the original Star Trek, all the way up till now. I think because the message is basically, hey, you're all part of the same strand. You're all, you all come from the same place. You're related, work together. And the joke at the moment is, is that they all just immediately start bickering and like, ah, I'm nothing to, like a Klingon. Oh, I'm disgusted at the yeah. suggestion. And, and, and they didn't really work together. There was a lot of duress. Yes, yes. They were chasing each other. They were threatening each other. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the actual chase itself was uh, some fun. I mean, before they get to the chase, I'll just briefly mention there is a little bit where Riker's like, is Picard like, you know, 
putting all the uh enterprise responsibilities down the toilet to go and investigate this murder because like they're meant to be going somewhere for a conference and he's like no that's warp nine we're going to this other planet because that's where this professor was this is this is too personal yeah uh it doesn't actually last too long it gets kind of dropped because once all these other races start to become involved you just kind of forget that it was even a question because it's like okay clearly this is important because we're actually racing other people to do it now yeah so, uh, but I did enjoy the Klingon in the episode. I thought his, uh, his interaction with Data was, was pretty funny. That was a very nice lighthearted scene, uh, where he wants to effectively do some sort of Klingon arm wrestle with Data, and is mad that Data wins so easily, and it's comically easy. He just kind of, like, immediately wins. Very, he's very impressed. He's like, hey, you'd be, you'd be a great Klingon. Yes, but not until after he headbutts him in frustration. And hurts his own head, of course, because uh, obviously data is made of all sorts of things. Uh, but then he tries to bribe data, and then when data starts spelling out, "Are you trying to bribe me? You're making an offer and saying that I can help you with this," and then suggested a reward, and he just like, oh, "Never mind," <laughs> he just walks away. Yeah, not not used to dealing with datorisms, is he? I think I enjoyed this especially in hindsight because it's the Cardassians that actually betray everyone else, and he actually comes off being quite, you know. Honorable. Yeah, he's a, he's a little bit annoyed that it's not a weapon. He's like, is that it? Is is it all that time we we just wasted all that effort for this? But... Yeah. Well, because they even do a nice little switcheroo here where Jordy like spots something in the computer, and the way it cuts to the next scene because the computer's finished processing, uh, you know, calculating where the missing DNA strand is because you know they've taken one from the Cardassians, they've taken one from the Klingons, uh, and the Klingons like basically nuked the planet. <laughs> that they got theirs from, so no one can get anything else from it. Uh, they, they're they figuring out where the last thing is. Uh, and you think that's what the computer, maybe what Jordy saw, but the little twist here is, and it makes sense because, you know, when Jordy reacted to the computer, it wasn't just, oh, the results are finished. It was, wait a minute, sir, better come and check this out. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that the Cardassians were trying to tamper with their shields and they play a little trick on them and tell them the wrong location, and then uh, they take Mr. Klingon on their way to uh, you, you, finish the thing. You the Cardassians did something underhanded? I, I don't think I believe it. I mean, we've not seen as much of them as we have the Klingons, but yeah, it's definitely the impression that I've been getting uh, over the last couple seasons of uh, Next Gen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they, they do be sneaky. Oh, did you like the casual uh, name dropping of DS4? Because now DS9 is a thing. We can just mention DS1, DS2, DS3. There's, there's, there's at least a one through eight. Yes, yes. yes. Um, I want to say I've heard of DS10 at some point. But I don't know if that was in one of these shows or one of the new shows. But I'm sure there's been a DS10. It's very believable that there is. <laughs> at least one I, more. I would assume it's got to be at least late. Assuming they're named kind of in order of when they were made uh, or occupied. With nine, that that's a relatively recent federation kind of acquisition, right? Are acquisition, kind of yes, but it previously existed under the Cardassians, right? So it did, but would they have not renamed it to Deep Space Nine when they took over? Oh. I assume the Cardassians had their own. That's, I mean, that is a good point. I don't know. They never. I don't know if they mentioned that they renamed it to Deep Space Nine. No, it's a logical assumption to assume that they did. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I am making that assumption just because why, why would the Cardassians have named it in keeping with the Federation system? That would make no sense to me. But also, it hasn't actually been mentioned, so... Mm. Yeah. But yeah, uh, so the, I mean, the actual message is a little bit R2-D2. You know, the, the algorithm is complete and it makes a little hologram message come out. Uh, or maybe, maybe a better comparison would be, uh, you know, Fortress of Solitude. This is jor popping yeah. out to say hey i am your father kind of thing and they're like congrats on being amazing species that all work together <laughs> to get here and they all look around at each other a bit awkwardly it's it's a very interesting thing obviously it's there to kind of answer the the nerdy question if you want to pose it you know why why do all the aliens all look all all or why are they all the same shape as human beings and the, the real answer of course is that because it's all human beings playing these characters so they just alter them a bit <laughs> you know they can change the face a bit there is. whatever I, I would also argue just on if you didn't want to go this route there's you know 
evolution taking similar paths across. of course yeah but there's there's obviously there's the uh they're all m-class planets after all so they're all evolving right. similarly yeah there's like the uh the crab theory right I, mm-hmm. I, it has a specific name i can't remember it but it's the idea that there are a weird amount of things that have evolved to be crabs on completely separate evolutionary kind of strands mm-hmm. because it's just the most efficient form for that environment in a lot of cases yeah yeah but you know this does give you a direct answer and but I think what's interesting about it thematically is the idea that, yeah, humans, Klingons, Cardassians, Romulans, Ferengi, whoever else, right? All the species that we know in Trek, they are all effectively just a part of the same community, right? And they kind of were in terms of like negotiations and, you know, civilization anyway at this point. But the idea that, yeah, we all come from the same place, we're all part of the same thing, it kind of makes the the analogy that all these different alien races is just a stand-in for different cultures on Earth. You know, it's all just an analogy for different, you know, races yeah. and countries and civilizations on Earth. It just means that, it just makes that more literal. That, no, this is, they all come from the same place, really. You know, if you go back far enough, they all come from the same species that planted their seed all over the cosmos. And as a result, they've all grown up. And it's just instead of Earth being the, the dome that holds us all, it's the it's the galaxy that holds us all. Yeah, it's just the exact same, just on a bigger scale. Yeah, uh, and I think and, I like with an alien being behind it. Yes, and I think I like that from a thematic point of view. That yeah, we all are part of the same thing. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong, we could nitpick and say why is this thing speaking English, or maybe more accurately, why is the translator uh, able to translate this the species that existed before any of these other life forms were even like a, you know, because it's <laughs> a very sophisticated piece of technology. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll go with it. I'll go with it. Because uh, obviously it's fine normally because it's all species they've encountered before. Well, not always. I mean, they, they do meet a lot of new species in Star Trek, they but do. <laughs> they do. But you know, I mean, hey, Picard figured it out with you know, the other. Uh, yeah, 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 it's all good. So, and like I say, um, how this being the answer in Star Trek makes sense. There, mm-hmm. there are definitely some sci-fi worlds where I prefer it to be the. Yeah, the parallel evolution path. Because those are pretty much your two options. I think depending on what the universe is doing, you know, what stories it's telling, what what's the point, depends on which one I prefer. And I think I do prefer this one for Trek because they say it is a bit more thematically relevant. It does give these, you know, if if Trek is supposed to be this look at a really good potential future, ultimately, right? Um, I think having that kind of idea of it being... You know, it's come from this place of, hey, you know, this cooperation, this this shared spirit. I think that makes a lot of sense for this particular universe. Which also takes us back to the the gift that he got at the start of the episode, which was the, you know, the statue that had all the little statues inside it. You know, the idea that we're all inside. we're all part of the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but both in like a like a physical sense, and that you know we're all part of the same species, kind of at, at base level, but also. Um, like we were just talking about how this is just like a representation of what it's like on Earth with different cultures just amplified across the cosmos. That statue kind of represents that. It's just, no, it's just the same, but just like, you know, Earth seem- seemingly has gotten over a lot of this shit in the future. You know, th- th- in the time of the Federation, we've gotten past all the petty things that Earth was fighting b- about before. But then you meet your new cousins, your d- more distant cousins <laughs> from these other planets. And all of a sudden, some of them are friendly, some of them are less friendly. Uh, and there's like there's a little moment actually uh, with uh, the the Romulan captain right at the end uh, where he calls Picard and and says, you know he it's like the the, the Ferengi oh, not the Ferengi sorry you on this episode the uh, the Klingons and the the Cardassians they instantly are just kind of disgusted with this suggestion but there's this idea that the Romulans are a bit more intellectual in those species and you know they're closer to humans in that sense and so it's he's the one out of the other groups that maybe sees the significance of this discovery and calls Picard and says, you know, maybe there's hope for us living in some form of peace in the future now. Yeah, and it goes back to what I said. I think there's already acknowledgement amongst Romulans that they're close to Vulcans. Mm. Like, you know, they have that much closer ancestor uh, in in their, relatively speaking, recent history. Um, so I think they're much more open to the idea already. I tell you this. Given how McCoy was super racist towards Spock all the time, I'd love a Mc- I'd love McCoy to learn this. It's like I want to see the scene where McCoy <laughs> finds out that they're actually from the same, you know, base species. That'd be 
that'd be interesting yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I'd be into it uh yeah so yeah i, I think it's, it's a really interesting mythology episode i think it's also fairly well done and that it's kind of exciting as all the different like groups start to get involved because uh, it's kind of a nice surprise when they all show up at one by one yeah i do think it's a bit awkwardly structured with like because it's very weirdly two halved as yeah because like you have all the greats like I, I like both halves. I really like all that stuff with the professor, uh, you know, and all, all that stuff for Picard on a personal level. And then he dies kind of out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, it's just like, okay, we're all on this now. Yeah, his, de completely... his death is the weakest part of the episode because it feels kind of out of nowhere and sudden. And like, it's just kind of this necessary bridge. But I really like what came before it and I kind of love what came after it. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. I, I do really like both halves. I just don't think they necessarily kind of tie together as neatly as as they could in to make this you know like a really like perfect episode. I don't think that like it need even to be extended out and be like to a two part or anything like that. Maybe maybe that would have worked admittedly with you know part one ending with uh, you know the shock death or whatever. But I, I think it's just a case of like just slightly rewriting how it transitions yeah. is all that, I like, think. That like ten minutes or so in the middle of the episode. I think it's just where it just needed to have another pass, kind of figure out a bit, a bit of a smoother transition period between the two halves. Uh, you know, you, you do that and you've got a damn near perfect episode. Yeah, as it is, it's actually pretty great. It's just, you know, there's, there's, is, there's yeah. just something to critique in it. But, uh, no, nah, pretty good. Probably up there. Uh, I mean, when we get to the end of the season, we'll do our top five, but I feel like this not, could not, be... Not too far away now, either. Yeah, this could be in the running. Like, you know, I'd have to go back and check, but I feel like it is... I think it'll definitely be in our kind of preliminary preliminary discussion at the yeah. very least so uh that is the chase uh so next time we will be looking at episode of deep space nine they're back to just alternating one to one for a little while which is nice uh there's one more pair of deep space nines towards the end of the season but for the most part it's just one to one for now which is easier to deal with because it's easier to remember uh but so so deep space nine is next that's the episode called the storyteller um i'm sure i already told you about that in the last deep space nine so i'll tell you about the next next generation episode uh, episode 21 uh now let's see what imdb says uh it's called frame of mind Riker begins to question reality when he finds himself in an alien insane asylum and faces the prospect his life in the enterprise has been a delusion i saw this episode of buffy <laughs> I, I've, I've seen this episode of smallville <laughs> oh don't bring smallville into this <laughs> oh i'm just saying everyone's done this episode do you think? Do you think this is the first though? Do you think other shows have done it before Next Gen? Because Next Gen is very much a, a big inspiration and in a lot of it, modern it TV. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, without actively tracing the lineage of the, of this episode. Oh, that's fascinating. Like, if people know in the comments if this is the first example of a TV show doing this episode, I'd be very curious. And then, and then I wonder though. Uh, it's definitely. It must have been done in like a comic or something before that, right? A comic, maybe, but I wouldn't say that it was necessarily inspired by that if it had been done in a comic before. Yeah. Um, and I, I totally buy that there's probably a movie before this, but it's that's different, though, to having a show where you're in the show for years and then you have an episode that suggests it was all in someone's head. That's yeah. a little bit different. It is different, which is why I went to comics, even as opposed to even like books, where it's it's not the same investment in a series as yeah. TV or, or comics, you know, and that long running sagas are. I suppose you could do it in a sequel in a movie, but I feel like you could. But again, you've got to do it in like your fifth, you know, your fifth movie. Otherwise, it doesn't have the impact. <sighs> well, Phantasm kind of did it, but it was shit. So let's not talk about it. Okay. <laughs> we don't talk about Phantasm Five, okay? We just don't talk about Phantasm Five. I'm okay with that. Uh, so yeah, Frame of Mind is next. Uh, it's got a pretty decent rating as well, so uh, should be good. Hopefully, hopefully it lives up to uh, my imagination. In my mind. No. All right. No, well, no. there you go. Let us know what you thought of this episode in the comments below. You can like, subscribe, ding the bell for notifications. And of course, you can support all the content by uh, liking, this or subscribing, ding the bell. I just said that. But also go to patreon.com slash TV and support us financially. Or you can do a one-time super thanks on YouTube if that's more your thing. Any and all help is appreciated and helps keep all the content coming. So, yes. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Keep watching Star Trek. And somewhere out there, <laughs> there's a secret. There's a secret ninth DNA strand. And it belongs inside...
the rectum of one Wesley Crusher. <laughs>